Hello, I'm uh, Paul Robinson. Um, and today I'm talking to you about specialist supportive clinical management for eating disorders, SSCMED. It's a therapy, as you'll see today, it's pretty straightforward, um, but it is uh, recommended as a possible <clears throat> treatment for um, anorexia nervosa in, in NICE. Uh, so that makes it an important uh, treatment. Um, uh, I'm recording this because in the session that we have, um, I'm hoping to um, uh, do, do a little workshop where you, um, uh, where you, you um, uh, practice some of the things I'm talking about today. Okay, let's move on. So what is it? Um, um, well, you know, I've told you what it, the, uh, um, acronyms, um, sorry, the, the letters stand for. It was um, first developed um, uh, at the University of Otago in, in New Zealand <coughs> and North Carolina in the States, uh, although it was actually trialed in New Zealand. And the principles of it are that you give information about eating disorders and in the therapy you focus on the eating disorder symptoms although you can stray into other symptoms if they're not too severe. So the basic idea is to encourage the resumption of normal eating. Um, and uh, for different eating disorders, this is achieved in different ways. Um, I'm going to be talking about eating disorders generally today, although the NICE um, guideline only recommends it for uh, anorexia nervosa. <clears throat> Um, I took the anorexia nervosa version and extended it to uh, um, other eating disorders uh, such as bulimia nervosa. And the basis for the approach is the supportive therapy model, that's the sort of paradigm, <clears throat> which uh, was described uh, by Harari in 2014. It's a journal which actually is available on the UCL website and I've given you the uh, URL below. As I said, it was developed for anorexia nervosa in the uh, Otago study, study, and they found little difference between SSCM and CBT um, in the long term for anorexia nervosa. It was supposed to be testing the efficacy of CBT, and SSCM was found to be almost as good. Um, so I developed it. Um, in collaboration with the original SSCM team for all eating disorders, specifically for the Nourish study. And um, I put the uh, URL for that study down there. So I've, um, I've, I've written a manual for the for SSCM ED and you can uh, get that on the Moodle page, the same as this one. So the characteristics, first of all, there's the symptom focus um, on factors leading to weight loss, um, on, um, uh, on weight regain, on reduction of bulimic symptoms, very, very focused. And the non-specific factors are using the therapeutic relationship, using a good therapeutic relationship to maintain engagement, that's really important, and to main, com maintain compliance with treatment. So the general model is psychoeducation and gentle coaching. Um, there's nothing too complex about it. And encourage and support. And um, you have to establish good rapport and you don't really investigate transference as you would in a psychoanalytic approach. So um, it's 20 sessions. Generally, people go for 20 sessions of 50 minutes. Um, 50 minutes is the psychoanalytic hour. But when, as soon as you do psychotherapy, you realize that um, it's a good idea to have 10 minutes at the end of a session to um, have a pee, have a coffee, and whatever else you need to do. It's only 10 minutes. Um, and then you start again with the next patient on the hour. You can do a lower um, duration of, um, of the session if um, you finish all you have to do in, in, in half an hour, say. Um, you do one session a week, um, or you can do less. 
and, and the total duration of therapy is up to a year. So if you work that out, it means roughly uh, one session every two to three weeks. But what you can do is um, uh, every week at the beginning or even more than once a week at the beginning and space out the sessions towards the end of the year. And you can, uh, under if you're having supervision, which you should be, um, you can discuss with your supervisor about um, adding up to five sessions. If someone gets to the end of the 20 sessions and is really getting there and or just needs a few more sessions to consolidate what they're doing, then that is allowed. You generally order, uh, record sessions, audio, you can do a video if you want. And this is for supervision. So you bring your audio recording to supervision. Um, also model adherence, your supervisor will want to know you're doing SSCM and not CPT or um, I don't know, screen therapy or, or something else. Um, also for model development, um, SSCM is a fairly straightforward therapy, but there, there's certainly room for uh, complexity in it. And um, depending on what your own background is, you can add um, uh, other things which uh, go uh, which go along with your own training, although that doesn't really change the basic model. You have to have supervision every week or two um, for a one to one and a half hours with a trained supervisor. And in general points, you don't interrupt, uh, have no interruptions during sessions. You don't keep um, your, your phone on. Uh, you don't uh, want people to knock at the door and ask you things. Um, so um, for some people who are on emergency call, you do have to get somebody to take on those uh, duties while you're uh, doing an SSCM session. I've told you about the appointments. You're, sp you're supposed to keep phone and email contact down um, between sessions. You shouldn't be doing a lot of um, phone therapy, uh, but you can do a bit. Um, you can organize the next session. You can respond to emergencies, things like that. And you tailor the treatment treatment for each uh, each patient. So there's um, several phases of SSCM. This is the initial phase. It's building the therapeutic alliance, informing the patient about the treatment, about what you're doing, assessing the history, the problems, the symptoms, and possible complications uh, that they're suffering of their eating disorder. And during that time, you'll be thinking, now I wonder what is a, should be on our target list. And you might, for example, think that weight gain should be on the target list or reduction of bulimic symptoms. Um, now, the patient um, may well have different uh, target symptoms, uh, may not want to put weight gain on it. And so you'll need to uh, discuss that with them. Uh, you can address non-eating disorder symptoms such as mild alcohol abuse, mild depression. But if it's severe, then we should probably be thinking of a more complex treatment or a referral to an alcohol clinic, for example. So here I am talking to a volunteer who is pretending, who is role-playing a patient with, uh, with bulimia. Come on. Okay, so and uh, understand that you're Catherine. Yeah. Um, first of all, my SSCM. First of all, the um, uh, initials mean uh, specialist supportive clinical management. And really, that just means that uh, the specialist in the sense that it's just for eating disorders. Uh, they're supportive in the sense that they're not um, another form of uh, therapy like cognitive behaviour therapy or psychodynamic therapy, all the lots of therapies there are. It's a, a supportive therapy, that's what that's the, that's what the name is. Uh, clinical management is self-explanatory really, it just means that to try and help you deal with the symptoms. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about what the symptoms are or what the, what the problems are that you've um, um, well, the main issue is that um, while I'm trying to like, you know, maintain a low weight, 
and uh, in order to do so, I'm going to try to eat less. And so what I do is that I try to eat less than during the day. And um, so yeah, so I don't have like much. Like I don't have a meal. I don't try to snack, so I can like go for more hours without eating. And uh, because I do do that throughout the entire day, then at night I get really hungry. Uh, so then sometimes I have a snack or something, and then I just feel like, you know, I kind of like broke the rule I have set for myself. So then I feel like it gets to a point where I want to have more and more, and then I just like get help myself, and I just have a lot of food, and then I feel so guilty. Um, and I'm really concerned about, about the putting on weight, so then I go on and make myself love it. So when you said you wanted to keep to a low weight, do you, do you mean that your weight has been a bit higher than this in the past? Um, I think so. Um, well, I feel like I feel like I know it's not maybe the best way to go about it, but I feel like this kind of helps me keeping like a weight I kind of like. Although I wish it could be even thinner, but I mean, um, I think what I've been doing has been kind of helpful. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Right. Okay. So, if we come to the question of what, what are the things that you'd like to change in this therapy? Could you, could you give me some idea of what, what they would be? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I wish I could have more kind of like normal eating because I know like. Uh, well, I'm not very proud of what I do. I feel like since I keep to myself and I don't really talk about it to people. Um, so yeah, I'm quite ashamed about it. Um, but I feel like I still want to, you know, have a low weight. I don't want to put on weight. And I'm very concerned that if I start having regular meals, I'm just having more normal eating habits, I might put on weight, and that's very distressing for me. Okay, so the first thing you you concerned about is really your eating pattern, this pattern of uh, under eating or trying to hold back your eating during the day mm -hmm. and then having a snack in the evening and then it breaks down and you overeat and then you then, then you are trying to interrupt that. Yeah. Okay, well I think we can make that number one on the list, uh, which we can call um, the regularised eating pattern. And um, I suppose uh, it might be worth splitting it because uh, if we say regularized eating, I can try and eat three meals a day, say, for example. Uh, the other one might be try and stop binging. Mm -hmm. And another one might be try and stop vomiting. Or yeah. well, we could put binging and vomiting at the same thing. Mm -hmm. and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, because you may, may find that as you um, Start eating regularly, that the binging will reduce, make it. Um, but I think it's still worth having it as a separate issue the binging and vomiting uh, to have that number two on the list. So the first thing would be to, to try and get to three minutes a day, which is, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, it's a really healthy thing to ask me to help you do mm -hmm. because I think it will be helpful. Um, now there's the third thing which you did mention, and I, I know having read your notes that um, uh, when all this started, before all this started, you were maybe five kilos heavier, um, which means that by by um, maintaining your weight at this level, um, you're really push your way down to a level below what it used to be fairly recently. And I think that may be driving the binging to some extent. Mm -hmm. It does happen that people who are underweight tend to overeat. Mm -hmm. What would you think about putting uh, some weight gain on your list of um, target symptoms? Mm -hmm. Well, I know that according to the you know, like my significant other say and so it might be a good thing. Um, but I'm not sure I feel very good about it. Mm -hmm. I don't have mixed feelings about it. Even like, there's a part of me that's aware it would be a good thing, but then again, I'm not sure I could really feel comfortable with my body, if that makes sense. Yes, I see. 
Yeah. One thing perhaps we could do, uh, maybe that we have a slight difference of view about it then, uh, is put it on the list as, as a, uh, a target symptom to be discussed. So we have decided definitely to, to go for it. Yeah. But uh, maybe at a later stage, you know, when you've made progress with the first two, it may be uh, an important point to uh, to start discussing that. Mm -hmm. um, and let, I, I won't commit you to, to making that a, a target symptom, but let's just make the target symptom the first two yeah. and, um, and see how we go. Yeah, that sounds good, yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of what you might do about that, about trying to uh, uh, regularize your, your eating pattern, would you feel okay about keeping a diary of your of your food? Yeah, yeah, I guess it would be fine. Because you need to uh, every day write down what you'd eaten, um, if you binged, if you felt it was a binge, and if you'd thrown up or, or vomited up afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I need to have that information, and then next time I see you, uh, we can look at that and um, see where. Uh, you might want to you might think about making making some changes. Mm -hmm. and maybe think yourself during the week about um, about at what point you think it might be possible to add in something during the day which would be less scary for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So that's the early phase, uh, which is negotiating the. Um, uh, the symptom symptom list, <coughs> target symptom list, I should say. Um, so there's the middle phase where you've you've done some work on the on the target symptoms in the first few sessions. Uh, you then review progress, review attendance. Uh, maybe in the middle, maybe after maybe a dozen sessions, something like that. Um, review the target symptoms and any changes there are. And um, <coughs> particularly if progress isn't being made. Uh, look at that and think uh, what we could do to try and uh, change the trajectory. And the final phase um, <clears throat> for uh, this therapy, as, as for, for all limited therapies, is termination of, uh, of therapy where you um, give the patient uh, um, a reasonable time to get used to the fact that the therapy is ending and start to discuss the future how you're going to um, manage uh, your eating disorder symptoms if they if they come back or if, if you still have them at all, um, and uh, how to uh, prevent relapse or how to manage any sort of relapse. So in, in SSCM, you don't look at interpersonal issues, cognitive distortions, schemas, suppressed or denied emotions, psychological mechanisms for symptoms and the patient's feeling towards the therapist. Now, all of these things are characteristics of other types of therapy you probably recognize. And uh, what you don't do is uh, try and give the um, patient insight into the reasons for their uh, symptoms. Um, you don't encourage them to regress. Um, personally, I don't think that's a good idea in any therapy, but uh, particularly in this one. Um, you don't have a psychodynamic, psychodynamic explanation or view of the eating disorder. You don't systematically explore body image, although um, it will come into uh, the therapy uh, because it always does. You don't um, involve the family systematically, um, although you sessions with a family member to explain <clears throat> what you're doing and um, uh, what they can do to, to help. And you don't deliberately foster mentalizing. Um, we've got a number of uh, appendices, uh, which I'll uh, let you have access to. Uh, what are eating disorders? How common are they? What causes them? Um, the effects of dieting, problems caused by restriction and purging, sociocultural influences, the ineffectiveness of dieting, uh, disordered eating cycle, uh, overeating and undereating, or other, the other way around, um, biological contributions to weight and shape, um, 
what the scales is telling you really saying um don't weigh yourself often because um the scales can really uh, confuse you um you, the whole question of nutrition and recovery how you recover from eating disorders and bone health particularly in anorexia nervosa although it is relevant to um uh bulimia nervosa as well so the worksheets um you use them um when um you come across something in a session which um suggests that you might need the worksheet somebody um is talking about so say someone's weighing themselves six times a day yeah you'll say well, look i've got a worksheet on that there you are someone says look this is all caused by um um uh, the, my relationship with my mother well it might be but um it's quite useful to give them um, an information sheet on what causes eating disorders things like that you can use them as you as you need to and of course these days you wouldn't give them a piece of paper you would email them something and you yeah, say there isn't um, a worksheet on the list say a patient has alcohol problems well write yourself a um uh, a worksheet on how to manage alcohol problems um, in relation to eating disorders. For example, if somebody always has a binge on a Friday evening when they have a bottle of wine and then they binge and vomit. Well, it sounds though perhaps restricting the alcohol a little bit might uh, might be helpful. And you can um, you can give some information on alcohol consumption and how it can affect eating disorders. And if you don't want to do that yourself, try and persuade someone else to write it for you. Um, and uh, we're now moving on to uh, managing specific symptoms. So facilitating weight gain, obviously this is a very important one. So you basically encourage a return to healthy eating. You establish goals for eating, three meals a day, uh, balanced meals, adequate quantity, um, establish goals for weight, um, generally, it'll be a, a range of weight. Uh, it might be a weight at which periods return. It might be a previous weight. Um, uh, or it might just be um, uh, a goal for that uh, for a week. So, you know, or for a month, say you might, you might say, we want you to be um, a kilogram higher this time next month, something like that. Use the educational worksheets as I've told you about. Um, you, this, this approach is very much uh, what dietitians do, but they have the added information, uh, which you have as well, actually, um, about the nutritional aspects of um, eating disorders. Um, and so they can bring those to, to bear. Uh, and so if you get stuck with weight gain or uh, with bul bul bulimia, and you think um, a dietary, a dietitian's approach might be helpful, because sometimes it can, it, it'll mean them seeing somebody else for one session and then they can come back and you can use what they've learned. So that can be quite useful. We don't generally use dietitians routinely. So bulimic symptoms, you ask the patient, as I did in the session, to give a dietary, to keep a dietary diary. You um, facilitate healthy eating. Um, you identify non-nutritional determinants of binging such as um, uh, um, sort of problems with um, uh, with certain people, for example, although you don't go into the interpersonal relationship with that person, you might just ask them to avoid contact with them when you feel vulnerable. Um, and psychoeducation about purging behaviours using the worksheets. weight range, um, establish the weight range for, it, for each patient. Um, generally, um, it'll be uh, the, the, the normal range, um, but the patient may still have lost weight, even if they're still in the healthy or even overweight range. And you may have to ask them to regain some weight because sometimes even within the normal range, patients with eating with uh, who are in the normal range who lose quite a lot of weight stay within the normal range but their bodies still react and lead them to binging and sometimes vomiting happens um, to try and 
keep themselves at the lowest, at the lower level, even though it's still within the normal range. So you may have to ask them to gain a little bit of weight as I did with that uh, volunteer. However, if BMI is low, uh, you got you almost certainly have to have weight gain as a target symptom, and you need to be weighing the patient regularly. If the weight is high, uh, for example, in binge eating disorder, um, generally adv the advice is to treat the eating disorder first and then discuss weight loss. Although bed has been treated using um, uh, weight restriction, uh, sorry, food restriction and weight loss, which, uh, which can improve the binge eating as well. But in SSCM, you treat the eating disorder separately from the weight, uh, which comes later. And substance misuse there, you can have that as a target symptom if it's mild. Um, as I said, um, someone drinks a bottle of wine a week uh, and that triggers off binging, you would, you, you would address that. If it's daily, more serious, or it's hard drugs, you would um, refer to the local alcohol and drug service. Generally, you ask the patient to leave if they arrive intox intoxicated. They're not gonna get much out of the session if they're sozzled, so um, ask them to come back uh, the next time when they're not under the influence. And impulsive behaviours, so impulsive spending or shoplifting, you can include it in the target symptom list and include it in the diary and discuss as you would with binging the antecedents and ways to control and reduce, reduce the behaviour. So in summary, um, SSCM has been found to be as good as CBT in randomized controlled trials for anorexia nervosa. That led to it being elevated from, for, uh, from a controlled therapy to a treatment in its, in its own right. Some people have called it a bridesmaid that's made it to be bride. Um, it's very straightforward and can be used by mental health clinical staff without extensive training. And it's a good first line treatment for adult anorexia nervosa, especially if waiting for more elaborate treatments are long. And I want to add that um, our experience in the Nourish study suggests, although we didn't prove it, but suggests that SSCM is also good for uh, treating bulimia nervosa, but that would need another study to, uh, to look at that. Okay, that's it.